Have you been curious about spiraling your math curriculum? Heard colleagues talking about it, but not quite sure what it is, what the benefits are, and how you can get started in your own classroom? Then this video series is for you. Hi, my name is Kyle Pierce, and I'm a K-12 math consultant and a former high school math teacher. For the past five years, I've been experimenting with different ways to spiral my math courses, and I'm really excited to share these ideas with you through this three-part video series. In this video, we'll define what spiraling a math curriculum is, we'll share why it's worth doing in your math class, we'll look at what one mathematician turned journalist believes to be the best way to learn, and finally, we'll discuss the effect of spiraling on retention. So let's dive right in and learn more about spiraling. What is spiraling the math curriculum anyway? Well, when we spiral curriculum in math class, we're organizing topics that might traditionally be taught in blocks or chapters or units of study over a short period of time, and we're introducing topics in smaller chunks and spreading them out over a longer period of time. While you can do this in many different ways, it's common to come back to the topic multiple times over the duration of a grade or course, and you'll be going deeper each time. Spiraling is commonly referred to as interleaving, distributing, spacing, or mixing the topics from the math curriculum, while teaching a concept in one unit or a chapter like you might see in many textbooks is commonly referred to as blocked or massed approaches. Generally, when I think of spiraling the math curriculum, I picture spiraling through all the big ideas through tasks early on in the course and at a surface level. At the end of the first spiral, we go back through these same ideas to build on our surface knowledge and dig deeper. We continue to spiral through these concepts, introducing more complex and rigorous tasks as we help students build their conceptual understanding and develop procedural fluency. I see this thinking as very similar to that of John Hattie when he speaks about surface learning and deep learning. By spiraling the math curriculum and using well-planned, thoughtful, guided inquiries and investigations, you can help students develop much needed surface learning and deep learning. When you read about spiraling, the big question many have is, why can't I just organize my course in units like I always have? And while the research suggests that loading up on all of the learning for a concept over a continuous block of time, it just doesn't have the same effect as mixing it up and spreading it out over the entirety of a year or a course. When we interleave math concepts throughout the duration of a course, rather than approaching the concept in a continuous block over a shorter period of time, Research from over the last hundred years suggests that students learn concepts more deeply and they actually retain that information for a longer period of time versus blocking. Experiments by Hermann Ebbinghaus, which were conducted on himself, were the first to investigate properties of human memory. In his experiments, Ebbinghaus would create lists of about 20 three-letter words. These nonsensical words were created starting with a constant, followed by a vowel, and then ending again with a constant. To test the process of committing new learning to memory, he would read the list and say each item on the list before moving on to the next. When he was finished the entire list, he would return to the beginning of the list and repeat the process. As you would expect, as repetitions increase, so did his ability to recall the items on the list. This work by Ebbinghaus was responsible for the creation of the world's first learning curve. While these experiments were exciting, what Ebbinghaus is most well known for is the forgetting curve. Using the same types of three-letter, nonsensical lists of syllables, he then began focusing his experiments on how long he could retain these items in his memory over time. His research showed that once he had learned a list, his retention would decrease with each passing day that he did not attempt retrieving the items from his memory. However, when he retrieved a list from his memory after short intervals of time that gradually increased, the forgetting curve would become less steep. In this graph, we can see an example retrieving information from memory after one, three, and six days of initial learning. Ebbinghaus believed that the speed of forgetting depends on a number of factors, such as the difficulty of the learned material, in other words, how meaningful it is to the individual, its representation, such as what connections to prior learning is made when doing the new learning, and psychological factors such as stress, sleep, or even how open to learning the individual is. In the Educational Psychology Review, Sun and Simon state, on the whole, both in the laboratory and in the classroom, both in adults and in children, and in the cognitive, 
and motor learning domains, spacing leads to better performance than massing. Surprisingly, much of what we believe to be true about learning is actually false, as explained in Benedict Carey's book, How We Learn, the surprising truth about when, where, and why it happens. He says, let go of what you feel you should be doing, all that repetitive, overscheduled, driven, focused ritual. Let go and watch how presumed enemies of learning, ignorance, distraction, interruption, restlessness, even quitting can work in your favor. So while I won't be suggesting that we promote distractions, interruptions, restlessness, and quitting in our math classes, some of the key ideas from the book have interesting implications for math class and school in general. First and foremost, Carey concludes that learning happens best when it's driven by wonder and curiosity rather than by fear or envy. When you consider the traditional approach to teaching math classes, usually blocking or massing concepts in a short period of time, followed by a one-shot test, it would seem that the learning is more likely to be driven by fear, for example, maybe failing, or by envy, maybe wanting the highest grade in your course, rather than by wonder or curiosity, as Carrie suggests. In order to promote learning driven by wonder and curiosity, Carrie argues that we should help students become curious thinkers, not as a means to do individual tasks like completing a section in a textbook, but for cultivating a love of learning in general. As a teacher who used to teach in units or blocks, I find it much easier to spark curiosity in my students when I spiral my math curriculum. By using three-act math tasks to teach new concepts, students' solutions and their strategies are much less predictable because these tasks are being introduced before any formulas or procedures are given. Spiraling makes it easy for me to lead a guided inquiry through these contextual tasks, which in turn creates an intellectual need for the new learning. I know that if I get students curious about a problem and get them to put some skin in the game by sharing what they notice and wonder, as well as making predictions before all the required information is shared, students are much more likely to learn and retain this new knowledge. You could read more about asking students to notice and wonder using three act math tasks on my website at tapintoteenminds.com forward slash notice dash wonder. Although the decades of research has clearly indicated that interleaving math concepts and spacing practice is much more effective than teaching in blocks and massing practice, we're still seeing the majority of textbooks and math classes organized in units. So you've got to wonder why. Well, one possible reason is because the illusion of understanding often experienced when we teach or learn using blocked instruction and mass practice. Because students are focusing their attention on few concepts and practicing them repeatedly over a short period of time, the facts, steps, and procedures are fresh in their minds and they appear to know it. Unfortunately, this perceived fluency is short-lived and often results in a lack of retention over time. Now, many of us and our students have experienced this sort of memory loss when we draw a blank on a written assessment. And I'm sure every teacher has had their students claim they don't remember how to do a certain concept that they were taught in a previous year. When we distribute or interleave concepts and space practice over time, this forces our brains to work harder, to retrieve information, and ultimately builds our retrieval strength. By waiting to come back to a concept just before it feels like it's fully forgotten, we're giving our brains exercise to retrieve those memories and build a stronger neural pathway to that information. Thus, Carrie not only recommends interleaving in space practice, but also using tests as an effective studying technique to promote retention rather than just as a measurement tool. Imagine that. We're using tests to actually study rather than studying for the test. The logic here is that each test where a student works on problems independently and without the aid of peers or resources is an opportunity for them to practice retrieving that information that's stored deep in their brains. This is something that we often don't do when we're studying. Now, while we might not be aware of it, many jurisdictions promote spiraling in their curriculum. Jana LePage from my district shared a great quote from the Ontario grade one to grade eight math curriculum where it states, when developing their mathematics program and units of study from this document, teachers are expected to weave together related expectations from different strands, as well as relevant process expectations in order to create an overall program that integrates and balances concept development, skill acquisition, and the use of processes and applications. Recently, the Ontario Ministry of Education Edugain's website released a spiraled grade one through grade eight math resource called Tips for Math, which does an excellent job spacing concepts to promote the understanding and retention of math concepts. If you're from Ontario, that might be a great place to start. I'll put the link in the resources. 
In the United States, curriculum such as Everyday Math by the University of Chicago promotes spiraling and always has, and they do a great job explaining their reasoning on their website. I'll also include this link in the resources. Well, that's about it for this video. I wanna thank you for joining me for the first of three videos in this spiraling math class series. Be sure to click the link below for a resource list of white papers, books, and useful spiraling links you should consider reading to learn more about the research supporting the use of spiraling in your math class. I'm looking forward to have you join me again in the second video, so watch your email for the link, and we'll see you soon.